Now, really, for the first time, people are starting to have different conversations because so much is coming out in the world of genetics and epigenetics and how technology has advanced to where the conversations are much broader. In hey, this is how we did it, but now this technology has advanced us to here, so we need to start using this. And and things、yes. are going to change, and they're going to change rapidly. Two most important days in your life are the day you're born, and the day you realize why.、Mm. And I realize why. I anyone I meet, I want them to realize their why. Because they become a person who is on fire, and we all win if we have more people like that in the world. Hey, sober people and sober adjacent people, welcome to I Have Twelve Questions. I'm Amanda Patton, your host, a leading expert on nothing. However, I am in recovery, and I love it so much so that I launched this podcast. Where we get to talk to people who are trudging the road to happy freaking destiny, across all the different ways that people get there. So while this is definitely through the lens of recovery and sobriety, the stories and the themes that we'll be covering are universally human. So love, loss, grief, excitement, parenting, outside issues, purpose. God stuff, whatever. In the words of the great Ted Lasso, by way of Walt Whitman, I want to be curious, not judgmental. So, like I said, we'll be talking to people in recovery. We're going to be talking to experts and practitioners who help those people along their path in recovery. And we're just really excited to hear people tell their stories and to be inspired by them, and to create a community of support for everybody in recovery and people who know and love people who struggle with addiction issues and whatnot. So, anyways, we're so glad you're here. And thanks for listening. Hey, listeners! Just a quick disclaimer before we get into the interview: these episodes may contain adult language and subject matter that's not appropriate for all audiences. Also, we are not doctors or psychiatrists, so what we share on these episodes is certainly not to be considered medical or psychological. Advice, just our own personal experiences, which we hope will be helpful to others on a similar quest. So that's it, and thanks for listening. Hey, everyone, our sober family and listener community. I am so excited、uh, to introduce our guest today. Her name is Dr. Evelyn Higgins, and her work is. Fascinating to me. You guys know I geek out on brain science and addiction and all that kind of thing,、uh, but we have an actual expert in the house today, so that's that's good.、Um, she's the founder and CEO of Wired for Addiction, and she's a recognized international expert in the epidemiology of addiction and other mental health complexities. And as a certified addictionologist, diplomat of the American College of Addictionology and Compulsive Disorders, and diplomat of the American Board of Disability Analysts specializing in pain management. Dr. Higgins has had the honor of advising U.S. Surgeon General, producing and hosting Gracie Award-winning nationally syndicated health and wellness terrestrial radio program, and serving as a 1996 Olympic team doctor and Olympic torchbearer. <laughs> That's awesome.、Uh, with 35 years in clinical practice, Dr. Higgins has designated over 16 years to research and development in the science of mental health and addiction recovery. And if you guys have not already seen her TEDx talk, her,、um, it is—it's awesome. It's very short, but it's packed、uh, with incredible、um, stuff. I'm going to put the link to that YouTube clip in the in the show notes for everybody.、Um, she's a panelist at the 2022 International Society of Substance Use. Uh, professionals annual conference in Abu Dhabi,、um, in the Arab Emirates, and the 2022 International Gambling Conference in Auckland, New Zealand, as well as a 2021 nominee for Modern Healthcare's Top 25 Inno- Innovators in Healthcare. Dr. Higgins finds herself at the nexus of epigenetics, neuroscience, and mental health.、Um, you can find out more about her and her work and connect at wiredforaddiction.com.、Uh, you can also find her on Wired for Addiction. On Instagram as well, and I know that was a mouthful, but man, you've got some、uh, you've got some accomplishments under your belt and some qualifications. So, welcome to the show. Thank you for Thank joining. You. Thank you. I appreciate the、uh, opportunity to be here, Amanda. Yeah, of course.、Um, well, I have to start with a funny icebreaker、um, just to get everybody comfortable. But、uh, down here in Texas, roller derby is a thing. I don't know if it is where you are. But if you were a roller roller derby 
player, what would your kind of like skater name be? Ah, uh, game changer. <laughs> <laughs> That's who I would be. That is awesome. I love it. Um, so I mentioned your TED talk, your TEDx talk um, in the intro, and it made me emotional when I watched it. And um, and I, but I felt empowered. Um, and it also explains the why and kind of getting to the root of that. And so, can you just tell it? Just tell us a little bit about that. Um, about, you know, either kind of an overview of what you, what you talked about in the video or your why really. Sure. sure. So I'm glad you felt empowered. That's why I did it. You know, for people to walk away saying, I have more that I can do here and there's more resources and just to make people feel like there's hope and to be able to move forward. So my why, um, 35 years ago, I was practicing in a rural area and um, I was in pain management and kind of the the model was try this, try that approach. Yeah. I didn't see people getting better, you know, and then 20 years after that, I'm practicing in an urban area thinking maybe, okay, it's different, you know, and, and, and it wasn't. And it was time had moved forward, but nothing had changed. It was still a try this, try that, half this, double that. Let's see if this works. Let's see if that works. But I was seeing people start to become addicted Mm -hmm. to pain meds. And if the results were there and people were getting better, there'd be a trade-off. But but it wasn't changing. Nothing was changing and people getting better. So that was my professional why. My personal why was I married a man who was an alcoholic. In reality, he had several addictions. Um, we had a daughter together. A year after she was born, we found out that he was adopted, knew nothing of health history, family history, genetics, knew nothing. And I needed answers. Yeah. You know? So it was not just my professional world where I was seeing things stagnant and nothing moving forward. We weren't using science to evolve this area of healthcare. It's almost like that stigmatized, like, well, you guys got yourself here, you can get yourselves out. And and technology wasn't being used to advance this area of healthcare. You know, if somebody had a heart attack, we wouldn't say, hey, well, let's see if they have another one and then decide what we should do. Right. You know, it was ridiculous. So I got to see it up close and personal, you know, and then I had a daughter. I'm like, well, what do I need to know for her? I don't have any information. So all of it together created where we are today. Wow. That's awesome. It's always interesting to me to, to hear people's why, why they started something, why, why they were curious, and especially to tie it back to something personal. Um, right. I... Anyone who knows me <clears throat> knows I geek out on neuroscience. My mom and I, we're always sending articles and like, it's just, it is fascinating. It is just, I mean, it's fascinating in general, but as it relates to uh, to addiction, I mean, obviously I have personal interest in that. Um, so your work and research blew my mind is that's not an exaggeration. You know, I, as I was reading through and, and the biomarkers and trying to understand how you would measure for that. And I was, I was excited and confused and like, you know, uh, curious. And so mm-hmm. sure. what do you mean when you say that like wired for addiction specializes in biological component of the bio psychosocial disease of addiction? Like what does right. that mean for people like us who didn't go to medical school? So addiction is called a biopsychosocial disease, that it's a triangle, right? There's the psychosocial part, your environment, how you interact with the world. But then there's the biological piece, the physiological piece. And we don't address that. I mean, really, as biological as it gets in the treatment world is, you know, exercise every day. It'll raise your serotonin. Make sure you get eight hours of sleep, stay hydrated, eat good foods. You know, the basic lifestyle you can't help but get get in a good place by doing those things. But we didn't look at an individual's physiology. You know, there's seven and a half billion people in the world with seven and a half billion different sets of DNA, yet we treat everybody like they're exactly the same. Mm. And that's why so many aspects 
that are treated with people don't really work because everybody doesn't fit the same mold. You know, and we, and we all have genetic strengths. We all have genetic weaknesses. And then we have the how we interact with the world, right? So that's the whole epigenetics part of all of this. It's the, the research now tells us that at the expression of our DNA can change. Right. You're born with your DNA. Here's your cards. Play them out. And that's not going to change. What changes is the expression of your DNA. And that's all the parts of how we interact with the world. Right. You know, it, like an example is somebody says, you know, I for 20 years, I never saw this behavior in my child. At 21, all of a sudden things changed. OK, well, let's look at their DNA you know, hey, all these parts were always there, but they didn't have the same stressors in their life. Now they went to college and then they're having a part time job and they didn't have you telling them everything to do along the way. They had to start making this for themselves. And yeah. this was a very stressful environment. And it was there in the foundation and now it expressed itself. Wow. That's wild because my just quick little tangent, none of my issues with anything, not even alcohol, just wasn't a thing um, until I was 29. And I could not, that's why you could not convince me that I had a problem because I've never had a problem before. Why would I have a problem now? Uh, because of exactly. death in the family, divorce, like having a kid too young, not being ready to be a parent, like just all these different things. And I was in, if you look in my family tree and my family history, it's everywhere. You know, my maternal grandfather drank himself to death by the age of 41. Yet I never made any of those connections. Um, and then I realized, oh my God, it was dormant the whole time waiting for life to catch up to where I didn't have any coping skills anymore, or I couldn't push the dam back anymore of, cause I'd gotten really good at stuffing and compartmentalizing. And then enough hard stuff happened all around the same time to where, um, for some reason I thought, of course I'm safe. I'm, I'm 29. I'm successful. Like I obviously am not going to have issues with alcohol. Like the rest of a lot of other people in my family, I'm fine. So when you say that, it makes me feel a little bit better, but I wish I had known before. I don't know if I would have changed my behavior, but I wish I would have known at least That's to know it. what That's kind it. of risk, you know? Right. So, right. You, you just nailed how it all works. And then to say you wish you would have known, I mean, that's really the focus on the TED Talk that I did. It, it's if in your use, you knew you had a genetic predisposition, would you make different choices? Right. And we should have that knowledge. Families talk about, well, there's a lot of cancer in our family. There's a lot of heart disease in our family. You need to make sure you do this and that. You need to be careful of this. But when it comes to the mental health, the substance use disorder portion of things, we don't want to talk about it. And it's, right. it's nuts because it's, it's, it's like anything else in health. Right. But we don't think of it that way. We think of it as a stigma or you just need to get it together. You need to figure it out or you shouldn't be, you just don't drink. You shouldn't have, you shouldn't have started with that in the first place or exactly. It's, exactly. it's shaming instead of, oh, wow, I'm sorry you're going through that. Let's figure out how we can help. So what, how does your work play into criminal justice? Cause that was something on your website that I found really interesting. Sure. So we work within the criminal justice system. In fact, our CEO is part of the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers and sits on their panel. And we work with people who have mental health issues or substance use that has gotten them into trouble. And actually, judges love seeing our reports because it allows them to make a decision for the first time, based on objective data, instead of he did this, she did that, this is repeating, this is blah, blah, blah. Well, unless we change it, it's going to repeat. And everybody right. loses, you know, regardless of where you sit on the political aisle on this, everybody in society is going to lose if we allow this to continue to happen and happen and happen, which is how it does. So we work, we, we even have work in jails. I mean, we have our lab kits sent to jails. They, they have their samples done. They start on their protocol. It makes huge changes in people's lives. One gentleman, this, this is, would probably be a great case to talk about because he had five prior DUIs. And 
obviously nothing was changing. He was going to, he had already gone to jail before. He was going to jail for a long time this time. They reached out to us. He is now a totally different man. And he said, I am, I, I am perplexed as to why no one ever told me about this. I'm like, because people don't know. They don't know, you know, and what you don't know, you don't know. So right. you, you think it's just, hey, tough yourself out of it or just stop. Well, come on. You know, if somebody has diabetes, we don't say, why are you so weak? Don't eat that. Right. Somehow they get a pass. You know, it, it doesn't make sense. That is incredible. And I love that you said looking at objective data because instead of blaming or like, you're a bad person or you did this or you did that, which, you know, yes, we, when we make mistakes, whether we're under the influence or not, we, we have to pay the price. Like that's, I'm not saying that that's a thing. Absolutely. But imprisoning someone indefinitely without treating the root, obviously recidivism is just going to continue to be what it is unless you've got, you've intervened on some level. And I also love the fact because people, human beings, I don't care if you're a judge I don't care who you are. We have biases. We cannot not have biases. And so that's another part of it that if you're looking at objective data, you're not looking at how they look or face tattoos or color of someone's skin or whatever. You're looking at the physiology. So I, th I think that's I think that's pretty incredible. And I really hope that's where we're going as a society. Like um, even cities in Texas, like San Antonio, has had really good models of getting people into treatment instead of because something's going on here. This is a mental health issue, you know. And it doesn't excuse the, um, and that's with maybe people who are unhoused or people who've had, who are repeat offenders, but you know, all of my run-ins with the law, I was under the influence of something I've, since I've been sober and before I started drinking and using, never had any problems with cops. So there's something going on there, but I didn't know how to make it stop. Um, right. so right. many of us think about, um, Drugs and alcohol, obviously, <clears throat> when we hear the word addiction, and we have to be honest about the fact that there's still a huge stigma um, tied to being an addict, you know, or an alcoholic or whatever. Um, but in one of your posts that I read, you said addiction comes in many flavors, not just drugs and alcohol. You say that addiction is anything causing negative consequences in our lives. Can you talk about how other numbing agents are also forms of addiction, even though consequences may seem like less dramatic or less dangerous, but th they still carry consequences for people? Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, your, your choice is whatever it is, be it alcohol, be it, you know, cocaine, whatever the case may be. But you, you're trying to self-medicate mm -hmm. a diagnosed condition not being treated correctly, an undiagnosed condition or a trauma and, you know, or one, two or all three of those things. But it, it's, it's in that, that we have to look at, yes, there is a mental health situation going on here. So it's whatever you reach for that makes you feel better. I mean, that could be sex, pornography, gambling, food, shopping, you know, any of these, what we call process addictions that, do that same thing. You're looking to feel better. And for right. you, that's what does it. And for a lot of people, it's whatever you meet as the first thing in your life. You know, if you're a kid that starts drinking, I mean, talk of stories of there was one gentleman who said the first time I ever had a beer, I was four. My, I was on the beach with my dad. He said, hold my beer. I'm going in the water. He's like, I tasted that. And I remember at four years old saying, I feel really good, hmm. you know, so it's at whatever age you have the experience with whatever it is that gets to numb you and have you feel better in that moment. And it's when it first starts, it works until it doesn't yeah. work. It works it so well. Your, yeah. 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 That's why you're always going back to it because you want to chase that feeling you had that for, it's like a first love. You know, it's like you want that feeling again. Yes. Wow. And it's interesting, too, how it morphs, right? So maybe you get one thing under control, but then here we go with whack-a-mole where, you know, it was eating and now maybe it's online shopping or social media yeah. or it's this or that, a codependency, like whatever. Um, because if the root of issues aren't addressed, it's just going to manifest 
you know, a million different ways. Um, so when you've gotten someone's results back from their pharma college, can you pronounce it for me? I'm sorry. Pharmacogenomic. Yeah. Pharmacogenomic. Yeah. What happens after that? What, what's, um, is it like a, you know, a food sensitivity or the report that you get that is like, okay, here's what we're going to do. Like what happens after they get their results back? Sure. So a pharmacogenomic test is used to see what pharmaceuticals are going to be most safe, cautionary, or most dangerous to you and your DNA. Wow. So instead of trying out, hey, is this good for me? Or do I have side effects? Or when I take my Zoloft, I feel horrible, or whatever it might be, we can eliminate all that. So that's that's kind of like the first layer of here. And really, when we talk about this, people say, well, everybody should get that. I'm like, right. You know, it shouldn't be that you wait until, let's say, something happened and you're in the emergency room and they're like, we need to use this, this and this. You would already know, OK, I can't use this or this right. works for me. And and it's it's a no brainer. That's it makes you wonder why we don't do that already. And I, it's, it's incredible to me though, that, that it can be mapped back and linked back to DNA to try to tell you, because I have so many friends on different things where it works great for a while, then they have to adjust it. And during the adjustment period they they can be suicidal. They don't sleep for three days. It's have it's hard to work and like raise their kids. And I'm like, how are you supposed to function when you're right. constantly, you know, um, and, and a lot of people, unfortunately, just go back to that drug of choice because it works in the moment and it's quicker and easier for the time being than waiting out, getting your dosages right or whatever. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. Or the fact that some of the medication has side effects of making someone, you know, maybe want to take their life and, and those decisions are made under the influence of medications that, you know, it would have been good to know that beforehand. So right. I, I think that is just incredible. So, um, I didn't realize this until several years ago, um, or several years after I got sober, but I was always wanting to feel differently too, mm -hmm. since I was very little, very, very little. I remember it. Um, and I always have just felt been so anxious 24 seven fidgeting, walking. I cannot sit still. And when I do sit still, my mind moves so quickly that I, it, it makes me want to go do something else so that I can get away from it. Or something. Right. Um, and I was a successful person in my life, like in terms of like, you know, what society tells you, you need to be successful. Um, and so being an alcoholic addict wasn't on my radar. I, I thought I'm just doing what I need to cope. Like it's, I'm just coping. That's not that big of a deal. Um, but your work states that just as in substance use disorders, process addictions are often the result of knowingly or unknowingly self-medicating a mental health condition like anxiety, depression, ADHD, OCD, et cetera, or trauma. How, how do you treat this? If, if it's even possible, how do you treat that for someone who doesn't want to take a uh, medication? Because I am terrified of benzodiazepines. I know Xanax works for me like a champ. I mean, I love it so much that I can never take it. Okay. Right. Um, so benzos are not going to work for me. Um, and I've tried other stuff like boost bar and other things that supposedly aren't addictive, but I didn't feel like they really helped that much. So I'm back to that thing of, you know, exercise, meditate, right. Do the thing, which I do all those and it helps, but it doesn't really help that much. So can, do you have options for people who, who don't want to take medication or maybe can't safely take certain medications? Absolutely. And that, that is actually the majority of people that come to us, Amanda, they're looking for something other than what well, in the work that we do, it's really broken down into four phases. It's not until the fourth phase that the introduction of pharmaceuticals comes in, because most of the time, by far the majority of the time, we don't even have to introduce them by the time we get to that fourth stage, because we've identified objectively where we need to support neurotransmitters, hormones, these genetic SNPs. So we know we have a blueprint for you as an individual. And then we look at those biochemical pathways and say, what makes this biochemical pathway work correctly? You know, I am not anti-pharmaceutical whatsoever, but it's really interesting that our first thought for everything is to go to a pharmaceutical. 
before we even look at, well, what goes on in that biochemical pathway to make it work? We don't have a single cell in our body made up of a pharmaceutical. Think about that. But the way we address everything as if we were total pharmaceuticals and we need more of it, you know, it doesn't make sense. So, So when you really dissect those biochemical pathways, you can support exactly where the support is needed and to what level support is needed. And everybody's different. So it, it makes total sense. And people start feeling better really early into the game because for the first time, it's been identified what we actually need to work on and to yes. what dose we need to work on it. Wow. That's, that's awesome. I've heard in meetings before, because <clears throat> I got sober through 12 Steps therapy. I went to treatment a couple times, got messed up immediately upon leaving. Had no, I mean, just, I was like, okay. Um, and so, but I've heard in the rooms a lot that we're not bad people trying to get good. We're sick people trying to get well. And I think like that for me, that was one of those hopeful messages of like, okay, I know something's wrong, but I don't know how to fix it. And I, and, and the more you fail when you break your promise to yourself that you're not going to drink today, you're not going to use today, you hate yourself more, the shame spiral, it just turns into this whole, and then you've got consequences from the drinking and the using. So then um, at, at some point it feels hopeless. It feels like there is no way out. Right. You know? Right. And then you just deduct that you're a terrible person um, who cannot be fixed or saved and just, you know, write it off a cliff. A lot of people, and so I think for, for you to talk about hope, and also it's such a relief, even if it's not good news sometimes from a doctor or whatever, it's such a relief to just know what it is. I'm not crazy. Like I'm not, I'm not, cause that's what I thought I'm overreacting or I don't know what's going on with me or I've lost touch with reality, but something was wrong and I couldn't figure out what it was. Um, and Amanda, you sound exactly like someone whose results were going over. Yeah, they say for the first time out loud, I'm not, and I'm saying this in air quotes, crazy. Right. Because once they see objectively, this is where you're at, this is where you should be, this is what happens when you're not there. I mean, there's there's tears of of joy often. Because yes. for the first time, it's like an exhale of like, wow, it's I'm not I'm not crazy. This is I'm not I'm this. Looking at it. Yeah. And 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 no wonder I'm struggling. Because I'm seeing this and it's not good, you know, and and when we go over it, I'll say to somebody, the good news is that we've got so much room to optimize. If you came back with a perfect lab, I'd say, hey, I don't know what to tell you. You This is all exactly where it should be. And then, you know, when you were, let's say you were on SSRIs, antidepressants, for, for decades, people that come to us have been on for decades and they're not doing what they're supposed to do. First off, no one ever took a deeper dive into doing the genetic portion of things to see if they have a particular gene that is going to make SSRIs less effective on you. Okay, so you've been on them. They're not working. You start to believe this is all me. I just want to mess up my life. I don't really care. I just, you know, I'm I'm a, a wreck waiting to happen. And that's not what's going on. No one has clearly identified or taken the time to say, let me see you as an individual and what's going on with you as an individual. Right. It, it, it's such a, instead of that self-loathing or self-hatred, it's this compassion. It's like, oh, of course, of course I'm having, of course I'm struggling. This confusion makes sense to me. And for me, it's really no different than if you've got a lot of stomach issues and people are telling you you're fine. And then you find out you have IBS. Or for me, the past three, four years, I've been feeling out of sorts in so many ways. I won't even get into it. But then a doctor was like, this is perimenopause. This, This is normal. This is yes. And I'm like, Oh, thank God. I thought I was losing my bleep and I am, but at least I know why. And at least I know there's supplements and there's things I can do. And at least I know it's not permanent. Like we're going to, we can do things. We're going to do some hormone replacement there. So, but I wish you would have just been like, no, you're great. Nothing's wrong. No, actually that would have been worse because then I would have said, well, Correct. This means I'm stuck with it. I'm stuck with whatever right. this is. Right. So it's almost nice when somebody says, not only do we know what it is, but we can help. We can we can work right. on it right. together. And, and I'll also add another layer to that, Amanda. When, when we're going over results and there's family there, they get to understand 
what's going on within their loved one, what that does for the support that that person needs, it, it, it's, it changes everything, right? Yeah. Up to my roller derby name. It's a game changer, right? It's a game changer right there, you know, because all of a sudden it's like, wow, this makes sense. And everything this says is exactly how you've been behaving. And wait, we can make changes? It's incredible. And I think too, especially if you've been able to be successful in other areas of your life, but you can't figure out that part of it. That was the stickler for me is like, this doesn't match up with who I am. I can overcome any obstacle. I've never, I've never had a problem. Typically when something goes wrong, you, you leave it behind, you know, you cut ties and you're like, this isn't working for me. I'm done. And so the first time in my life, logic could not be applied to addiction and I did not understand it. And so I kept trying to learn more, understand more. And I thought this enough knowledge about it would make me stop doing it. And it didn't. And people would look at me like, you're such a tough person though. You're so smart. Why do you, why are you doing this? You know? Right. And I right. don't know. <laughs> I didn't know why, you know. Exactly. Um, that would so, add another layer to you, you know. Right. Right. Yeah. And it, it's, you know, like you said, we, our society, we just want to get fixed, right? Just give me a pill, you know. And, and that's how my whole Xanax Adderall situation started because I was going through a divorce. We lost someone in our family to cancer. And I just said, I need something to help me be motivated in the day and sleep at night. And so I got Adderall and I got Xanax and I was mixing it with alcohol and it worked beautifully for like a year. And then, oh my God, you need so much more to function and then it's not fun. And then withdrawals are so bad you can't. So for me, that's what it, you know, that's what it kind of turned out to be. But can you share, and you kind of already alluded to one example, but can you share a story of transformation of a client um, sure. that you've had or that you sure. have. So, yeah, I did allude to the uh, criminal justice system. I'll tell you another great story. I actually use this as a case study at the international conference in Abu Dhabi. Um, a six-year-old parents came to us. Uh, she was adopted. She was born with neonatal alcohol syndrome. And she is in pre-K and already on the third school that she's been basically told you've got to find another school because of her behavior. So parents come to us, we do all the testing. And and, I mean, you you think about this child's life. She coded three times before she was out of the hospital. Um, You know, it, it was, it was a struggle from day one in her life. And you're looking at someone seeing them. If we do nothing like, which is what we do, we just watch it evolve well, she's going to turn into her mom that birthed her, not not her adopted mom, but her mom who birthed her because all those same things are going to happen again. So we do the testing, the lab starts the protocol. By the end of the year, she won the character award of her school. So what? you think about, I, I get goosebumps. You think about not only her life has changed, but the kids in her class her, her students, because she is now reacting and acting differently to them, to the other kids in her family. They have another adopted child and they have two biological children. Their lives are different as a result of her behavior. So this child's life is on a totally different trajectory. That would have never been. We know where she would have wound up. Unbelievable. And so it was a matter of looking at uh, neural pathways or, or chemicals or synapses. Like, I don't even know. I don't know. Do you do brain scans? Do you do blood work, urine, swabs? Oh, yeah. All there's, there's, yeah, all of it. There's, there's samples taken. So we're looking at neurotransmitters and things like serotonin, dopamine, epinephrine, norepinephrine, the list goes on. Hormones from stress hormones to sex hormones and how those interact together. And then those genetic science word here, single nucleotide polymorphisms. All that means is that there's an error in the genetic coding. So we isolate, we measure, and we identify. And then from that, we say, okay, look at the biochemical pathways of where we have problems and what do we need to do to have those pathways work more optimally. So she, and she probably came into the world depleted in certain chemicals because of the, her own, what in the womb, the physiology that she kind of inherited, I guess. Correct. 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 
see in our society, I think would have let that kid keep, keep growing up. Like you were saying, we do nothing and labeled, get labeled early on as a bad kid. They get put in that, you know, pipeline and, you know, in the system. And then you just look at them like, oh, they're bad. They're just a bad kid. Exactly. What happens to a kid when you throw that label on them? It's human nature to own that label. Okay, I'm a bad kid. Watch me. I'm going to increase layers of bad. Just watch me. Yeah, and that's exactly what we do. So do you, so in that case, does she also get talk therapy? And like, are there other? Yes, yes. All around, okay. Yep, yep, yep. And and that's part of, we're, we're doing the physiology component of the individual. They then get their their therapy, all the other parts, the psychosocial part. It's not just we're the the end all be all. It's one piece of all of it. That's why it's such a complex disease. That's why it has so many layers because no two people have the exact same life. So you haven't had the exact same experiences. So your physiology didn't start in the same place, didn't change at the same times, didn't end up where it is. It's just fascinating. Um, how do you encourage this kind of mental health support in the workplace? Like, is this something that you're, that could potentially be part of what's offered, um, sure. in like employee assistance programs or whatever? Like, how do we get this more talked about? Right, right, right. So exactly. So we do work with EAP programs and employee assistance programs. And for every $1 spent, the company gets back $18 because you have a more productive employee. Just it's common sense. If somebody isn't struggling when they come into work, are they going to be more productive regardless of what job they do? Of course they are. You know, so it's it's it makes sense in every single way to take the time, take the energy and take the money to get somebody functioning optimally for them. We all win as a result of that. Yeah. To your point earlier of how there's a ripple effect. Now, everyone on that person's team, the people they report to the customers they interact with and at the end of the day. And, you know, a lot of people don't want to, they don't care about the human condition. They don't want to hear about excuses or you should just, you should behave better, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Like there's that camp. Right. And then there's the, and then there's the camp of like, um, you know, well, we can afford to pay for, you know, this, that, and the other. And it's just very interesting in workplaces, how some of it's very toxic about, you you don't feel safe to talk about mental health issues. You would never take a day off because of that, you know, and, um, it's very interesting to me how, um, having that ability to, to seek help. Um, and if you're not into human interest stories and you really only care about the bottom line, guess what? It's going to help your bottom line too. Yeah. Yeah. If you care about nothing other than money, you're going to make more money. Guaranteed. (laughs) That's simple. Because we've we've had, I'm a, I'm in software consulting and we've had clients that like, they don't want to talk about change management. They don't care how people feel about it. It's a mandate. This is what we're doing. Who cares? But if you will just take a minute to care, about people, um, guess what? You're going to make more money. And then they're listening. Sadly. I mean, to me, I'm like, how do you not care about the human component? Whatever. Um, but at the end of the day, like you said, everyone, everyone benefits. So how do you, I'm interested in this and I don't know that you do can do this from a, with the physiological, um, component of it, but like, how do you support the family of someone who is in, you know, active addiction or mental health, you know, recovery or, or whatever. Cause you said they were there sometimes when the results are being read. So how do you support them? So a lot of times um, when they're uh, of age of being say a married couple, oftentimes it'll be the couple that comes and yeah. going over those results, as I said earlier, with both people really has light bulbs go off on their partner, on their spouse, or whether it be your child, whomever it is. And they can now understand how it got there. They can understand the struggle, right? So now it makes it an open dialogue. The the cat's Mm -hmm. out of the bag, so to speak, right? Here's the issues. Here's what we need to do. This is me and we need to make changes. And it, it just makes it so much better. And then the, the other member of the family or other, or other family members, they, they'll ask questions. They're now invested 
in what's happening. And it really becomes a much greater healing process all around. Do, do just as this wasn't on my questions list, but do family members ever then want to get their stuff done or start asking questions about their own reactions to life? Maybe it becomes a family healing situation or a couple's yeah. healing. Yeah. Oftentimes um, when it's a parent or parents with a child and they start hearing how we all get our genetic makeup from our parents. Everything's passed down and the good and the bad, you know, it's, it's, that's <laughs> what makes us all individuals. You know, we want to praise that we're all individuals yet we treat everybody like they're the same. It doesn't yeah. make sense. So they'll hear it and say, you know, probably I should do this. I'm like, it would be a good thing. You know what? And yeah. your life would get a lot easier and your parenting would be better. And your, your personal life would be better. All of it would be enhanced right. as a result. And it's, it's not pointing fingers. It's not because, like I said, we all, we, we have the gift of life. We got it from yeah. somewhere. Yeah. You know? And I love this objective approach of like, where it doesn't have to be about blame, you know, or, or, cause a lot of people, if you say, and this is why in the rooms, it can be controversial. Sometimes people who disagree with it being a disease, um, they'll get upset about it because they're like, that's a cop out. That's an excuse. That's a victim card type of mentality. Like you have agency over your decisions and you are deciding to drink and use. And so you have to pay the price, period. We don't care why. We don't care if you were abused when you were growing up. We don't care what your situation is. Like get it together. And so you don't want to blame people or the upbringing or even the child about like being born with in the condition, you know, that she was born in because of her mother's choices that yes, that sucks that that happened, but also that mother also carried with her, her own wounding and her own physiology. And we can break cycles with this type of information. Exactly. You know? Exactly. It's, you know, it's not a moral flaw. Maybe the behavior becomes consequential yeah. that you can say, Hey, that's not okay. And there's it's a penalty okay. for what you did. And that yes. should happen. Yep. But but to not change those cycles is insane. Yeah. It, it doesn't make sense for anybody to have a harder life when you, it doesn't have to be that hard. It doesn't make sense. I love it. Um, so for me, I have to believe that I do have control over my choices and that the onus is on me at the end of the day, right? That, that I am responsible for my choices. Um, but I also live with wildly fluctuating anxiety and invasive thoughts, which is not fun at all. Like, just like I said earlier, it drives me kind of nuts sometimes. Um, but I cannot put narcotics into my body and feel safe. So how hard is it to get, convince people, even with science, that, that, that addiction isn't just someone who can't control their impulses? You know what I mean? Like, because with a judge or an employer or whoever you're talking to, or you're trying to convince a company to spend, you know, to invest in, in having this as part of the EAP por portfolio, can you tease apart? Because like I said, we have this punitive society, right? Sometimes our society loves to see people fail and then talk mm -hmm. about what a terrible person that is and how you should lock them up and throw away the key, as opposed to like, what is going on with you? Are you okay? Type of, and it's, it's so interesting how employers or family members or whoever, um, we all have different ideas about this. So how do you, how do you use the science to convince people that people can, can alter their behavior, um, with physiology, you know, with the changes that you're kind of implementing? Right. So, so once it's explained and, you know, what we're doing here, Amanda, is taking some pretty heavy duty science and boiling it down to where anybody could understand it. But once somebody hears, it's like the light bulb goes off of like, yeah, how did I get here? You know, and, right. and that's, that's traceable and that's your physiology and your physiology has to be addressed. And there's no two people on the face of the earth that are exactly the same. You know, and, and once we 
we objectively find out where you are instead of guessing or diagnosing someone based on vocabulary. What if, what if your definition isn't the same as mine and we both think we're at the same place? We're having a conversation. What if I go to the doctor and say, doc, I just, I don't, I don't feel like getting off the couch anymore. Am I depressed? Well, who knows? That's a guess, <laughs> right? Right. So we do lab work and we know exactly where you're at. That makes sense. And I love that too, because the, um, what is the thing where you diagnose people from? It's sort of the DSM or the widely used. Yeah. How can that, how can that be? You know, you, so, you just take I mean, this grouping of, of, of arbitrary, you really don't know the whole story or the context. And so you're making a lot of assumptions. Right, right. And diagnosing and, now- and then prescribing based on that diagnosis when maybe that's not what it is, like you're saying. Right, right, right. Now, really, for the first time, people are starting to have different conversations because so much is coming out in the world of genetics and epigenetics and how technology has advanced to where the conversations are much broader in hey, this is how we did it, but now this technology has advanced us to here, so we need to start using this. And and things are going to change, and they're going to change rapidly once this starts going, because there's just so much being done out there in this area. And it truly is precision based on an individual's makeup, instead of, hey, here you go, everybody. Right. And I hate to compare it (laughs) back to my own personal issues with perimenopause stuff, but like they had to do all of these diagnostics and understand my body, not based on symptoms or how I feel this day or whatever, but let's look at the blood work. Where is your progesterone? Where's all the stuff? And then we're going to build this pellet and these supplements based on exactly what Amanda is deficient in as opposed to synthetic hormones that are cookie cutter across the board, like here, try this. Maybe you'll feel better. Maybe you'll feel worse. We don't really know, which is right. what you were saying. Right. <laughs> right, right. You know, and, and when, when someone else says it, what did I do? I left. I'm like, right. But that's how it's done. It, it, it's, it's, it's insane. It doesn't make sense. So, um, I guess I did have another quick question, which is more, you know, practicality wise, but is this affordable for people? Can people get help to get it if maybe they don't have the money to spend or maybe that does insurance? You know, what does that look like if you're desperate to do this for yourself or a loved one? How would you go about getting getting it done and and getting help maybe if you can't afford it? Right. So right now it's still out of pocket. We had a very large, very large um healthcare provider come to us wanting to do a pilot program because they know the efficacy is there. And if they do it, other insurance companies will want to follow. That is huge that they can do us. Huge. So starting there, it's going to happen. Um, But right now it's still out of pocket. We work with finance companies. We do whatever we need to do to get somebody the help that they need. And then scholarships or, you know, whatever you would call it, if someone is incarcerated, maybe are there in a treatment center or they're in a, a psych ward and, you know, are you able to work with institutions, I guess, to. Sure. Find- yes, actually, yeah. um, in, in the state of Florida, we are JAC vendors, uh, which if someone can't afford to pay for it, the state pays for their panel to be done. That's how much they see the value of what's here. That's incredible. It is incredible, especially given our 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 system. Typically, right. the way it traditionally right. looks at those kinds of things, um, and even even in in those types of situations where people have programs they can participate in, or uh, the ability to study, or to knit, or to paint, or to um, heal and to have access to these different things that they, the science, I mean, the data is there and has been for a long time that recidivism is reduced. Um, right. exactly. But, exactly. Yeah. And so then going many levels deeper of like looking into someone's DNA and physiology and really that's, it's just incredible to me, but it's also depressing because <laughs> I'm a little bit of a pessimist. My, my racing mind tends to, you know, focus on like what's wrong with this picture, but all the lives that could have been, you know, saved, helped, 
positively impacted if we had implemented this stuff a long time ago, because the technology, it sounds like it's been there for a while. Yep. 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 Some of our biggest torchbearers are parents that have lost children. There is no greater, no greater pain in life. And for them to still say, had this been available for my child, there's a good chance my child would still be here. And they're the torchbearers for what we do. That speaks volumes. That's the biggest endorsement you could ever ask for. Um, Okay. So final question. Um, I could talk to you forever and I'm going to, I'm going to reach out after this because I just, I have more questions for my own personal self. Um, But what do you want Two-part question, I guess. What do you want your legacy to be personally, and and then also wired for addiction? Like, what is it? Because this isn't you running a business or a, a practice trying to just help people. You're literally working to change the game. Like that is not an understatement. This is on a systemic major. Right. So, what's your what's your legacy, both personally and and for wired for addiction? So personally, I'd say one of my favorite quotes is from Mark Twain saying the two most important days in your life are the day you're born and the day you realize why. Mm. And I realize why. I, anyone I meet, I want them to realize their why because they become a person who is on fire. And we all win if we have more people like that in the world. So that's my personal. And then for Wired for Addiction, we want to see this become part of, you know, you go to the doctor and you have your CBC, your complete blood count done every year, your white blood cells, your red blood cells. People say this should be like done for people as part of here's your health. I'm like, absolutely. So to see us get to that point where we can prevent mental health issues that ruin someone's life, deaths. Couldn't ask for more than that. That's huge. It's huge. And I wish you all the luck. I can tell. I mean, I know that you all have a lot of traction and you're just all over the media and you're just out in the world evangelizing for this cause and for the, you know, what I love about it though, is that it's science. Like, you know, because we've all, everybody has opinions and this and that and anecdotal, but, but it's, it's the actual science and that you can, you can bring that to bear and, um, you know, potentially change a lot of lives and, and improve. Um, but also if you look at incarceration or, you know, all the things that happen as a result of people, when we are under the influence, right. you know, we, right. we act out of character, we, we, you know, potentially do things that we wouldn't have otherwise. Not to mention, um, you know, just to be able to enjoy your life. Right. It's such a simple thing that we, many of us take for granted. Um, and you look at somebody and, and this happens a lot, you know, in our society and I do it myself and I look at somebody and I'm like, how could they be unhappy? Look at their life. Like it's, or, you know, or you see someone whose life looks so hard and they are so full of joy. Yep. And you're like, what? You know, and so I think trying to understand, you know, what's going on with that is just, it's fascinating, but it could, it, it will break generational cycles. It will change the criminal justice, you know, workplace, it, family dynamics. I mean, it's like every single area of life. Um, so thank you so much for, for joining. And do you have anything else that, that I didn't ask about that you want to say? No, or- Great, Amanda. Great conversation. Um, I'm sure you can tell. I, I love to. I have passion about what we do, and 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 hope that it resonates with people, so they feel like there's something that they can do, an action yeah. step. Um, yes. Uh, our website, I think you said it before, is www.wiredforaddiction.com. You can go on there. We even have our um, clinicians that will offer a 15 minute consultation with somebody to hear what's going on with them and then say, point you in the direction, or is this something for you or whatever it may be. So we offer that to your listeners as well. And you can mail, do you mail out a kit essentially? 
Yeah, we drop ship. We work with people all over the world. So we drop okay. ship lab kits to them. And with the instructions for a sample collection, just like you would for anything else before you have it, you know, don't eat this, don't do that, blah, blah, blah. And we get those results back. We create the biomarker evaluation report, 31 page report. We go over every single biomarker with you, what it means, what are the clinical correlations, and then what are we going to do to make changes? Right. Create the protocol. That is, that is incredible. Um, well, I have learned a ton today and I know that everything that you've shared will serve my listeners really well. And I feel really grateful to know more about this and I'm so excited. It's like the frontier, you know, it's just going to change so many things. So thank you for the work that you do, uh, for the community at large. And, uh, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. And thank you, Amanda. Thank you for, for your podcast, because that's how people learn. So thank you for the work that you do. Of course. 